Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have been uh, on and off with um, Ken Fadner here for um, 30 years. Anyway, so, um, all right, so we're here to talk about how you personalize emails for a diverse audience. And obviously, um, Sharma has a diverse, or had a diverse audience. <laughs> I, don't know. I guess you will still have one at Home Depot. Yeah. Um, and uh, Christina has a diverse audience at Eversource. Oh, Christina. You, I, I didn't introduce you. She, uh, Christina Moy um, works for Eversource. What is your title there? Um, I am a marketing campaigns analyst for energy efficiency. Okay. So, but you're, you're handling the email, right? I handle all the emails. So I was brought in as the email strategist, the first email strategist. Their first? Ever. Oh, wow. Okay. So um, let's talk about that. Uh, you, I know, have some government um, regulation of your emails, right? That is correct. So uh, for those who are not familiar with Eversource Energy, uh, we are probably one of the biggest uh, utility companies in New England. So we service Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And being a utility, you are basically government <laughs> regulated with a lot of what you have to say. So with all these fancy emails that I would love to do, uh, we can't really do that. Uh, we have to be compliant with a lot of what our regulators tell us, and of course, there's kind of that whole idea of your utility and you need to really focus on customer satisfaction. That's our number one metric that we are measured upon, uh, not only by like investors, but also each uh, state's regulators. Each state, you have different regulations there? Yes, we do. Oh, wow. That's a handful. Um, okay, so um, how do you personalize... Sh Sharma, let's, let's go with you. How do you personalize emails for a diverse audience, or, or do you? Just making sure that was on. <laughs> um, yeah, like, we do more personalization for our season ticket members um, because we have so much more data on them. So, like, the email that I showed um, at the end... Um, you know, that was based on games they had attended, concerts they had attended, upcoming concerts that we had that tied back to, like, concerts that they had already attended, um, and then, like, member events that they had come to as well. So we, we really go deep into the personalization for them um, to give them that special touch point. Um, we're still trying to work through how to bring that same experience to our single game and single concert buyers, um, but we're not 100% there yet. Okay, so what you're using what kind of data to um, to to uh, determine what kind of people you're how you personalize? Oh, gotcha. Yes. Um, we use their purchase data, um, and then um, we can get the scans like when they come into the arena um, because we are completely mobile ticket, um, so we can get all of that information back in. Um, trying to remember. Wow. And then, like, we've done surveys throughout the year where okay. we're collecting that data from them as well. And so we can kind of action off of that as well. And, Christina, you um, also uh, handle emails that uh, uh, address outages and things that's like correct. that. Yep. That's uh, obviously very personal because that's yeah. an area that might be affected. Um, how else do you uh, use personalization? Sure. So when you're thinking about a utility, you have an account number. And you can also have electricity, gas, you might be dual fuel or you might have solar. So in the utility space, it's always been kind of um, with email addresses, it's based on account. And we're really trying to change that view to make it more on the in individual level. So for example, you could be a property owner of more than one property, you might have five, and those are all different account numbers. And based off of those premises, you might get certain information about your bill, for example. Um, for energy efficiency, uh, we have a different approach just because we have more of the sales and marketing type of organization where we're trying to drive behavior. So for different premises, we might try to have different um, programs that people might qualify for. So if you have like five different homes, for example, you might want like a home audit for certain ones in that service area. Wait, excuse me, if you have five different homes? Some people have that. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um, 
basically from that, uh, we can get people to get uh, a home audit, and if they participate, then we're kind of using personalization from that. Uh, you had a home audit, uh, maybe you want to take um, some recommendations from that home audit, so that might be one way. Uh, the project that I'm um, working on is for some utilities, or for most utilities, they use a uh, program called Home My Home Energy Reports. So some of you might have that delivered um, by email or print or both, and that's basically taking your personal usage of electricity or gas and kind of uh, figuring out ways to be more energy efficient. So there might be uh, a rotation of tips on how you can be um, more efficient if you're a high energy user or if you're very efficient already, how do you keep that behavior up? So uh, that's how we really play with a lot of our data. We take in a lot of uh, what's being used and we kind of figure out, um, we're trying to use uh, a little bit of machine learning and AI and we have uh, models that benchmark where people are as an efficient user of energy. And that's how we kind of drive behavior in that way so that people can engage more with the utility. So. Excellent, thank you. Now, you're on the tech side, right? I am, And yes. you're on the creative side, obviously. Yeah. So um, w what is it, like, when, when you want to create something, <laughs> what, are you, what are you looking to Christina for tech-wise? Help. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was that was one of the things that um, became a struggle this year um, because I could dream, but then it was like, as I'm walking out of the room, like, oh, I have to execute on that, and I may not know everything that I need to know to execute that fast. Like, I can get it done, but it would take me significantly longer than like someone like Christina. And what do you look for when somebody like Sharma comes to you and says, I want to dream big? <laughs> sure. So I'll just mention I, I have a, um, more of my experiences on B2B. So I think from that experience, I've brought in that to BC and B2B to kind of figure out what the roadmap is. And I, I found that having the roadmap is what your strategy is to make an idea have legs to run with it. And that really dictates whether you can execute something. So it's really taking a big idea, literally taking a whiteboard and drawing it up, making a workflow, and seeing what do, what do I have to work with? Um, that could be multiple data sources. Do I have a creative team? Do I have a, a business intelligence team to get that data and to put those pieces together? So it's really taking an idea and translating it technically and seeing from there what are things that I can keep? Now, what are things that I might need to tweak a little bit, or what are things I can kill off? And um, back to what we were talking about mentoring before. Um, you spoke, to, you addressed this a little bit in your um, presentation, but um, what skills exactly are you looking for when you hire or you want to hire a team of email? Yeah, um, when we were interviewing for the coordinator role, uh, one of the things that sold us on the young lady that we decided to go with was that she had significant like coding experience um, just for like what our director was looking for is like the direction he wanted to take um, emails going forward. But she also had experience working with sales reps. Um, and so one of the things I didn't touch on um, was when we're doing everything for the Hawks and the arena side, like we have a team of I think it's like 60 of them, uh, it's a lot of sales reps, so they're doing B2B stuff. So I was supporting them as well um, in, a, in addition to all the B2C stuff we were doing. So she had a skill set working with you know, what their email should sound like, how they should look, how they should be different from the overall brand's look and sound. Um, so that was really important. Um, and then she looked at the current emails that we had and she critiqued them um, during her interview. And I told her, like, don't hold back um, because this wasn't, this wasn't my, um, my, uh, my true skill set. So I was like, they got out the door, they, you could read them and people were opening and clicking them. Um, so that was really what we kind of leaned into during her interview. And you, Christina, what do you look for? Sure, so when it comes to email, 
uh, as you all know, it's not just getting copy and mm -hmm. pa pasting it and sending it off. It's not really a blast. I hate that term. And, <laughs> and, and really, what, what it really comes down to is educating your peers, mm -hmm. just because people don't quite understand that channel, how powerful it can be. People are always saying that email is dead. It's not. And really, it's about using it in a st strategic way and really thinking about how you're touching uh, your consumers. So um, coming from B2B where people are pretty good with buy-in, going to a utility, it, it's taken a while to get people up to speed. Mm -hmm. And um, before I was really brought in, people would batch and blast. And when I came in and audited everything, I was horrified. Um, and really, with that, it's really trying to educate people. There, there's design. There's HTML development that needs to be um, put in place. And then there's also communication is very key. When, when things are very siloed, there are things got, that could be going out the door that you don't know about and then you get a call like we work with our call centers we might get emails and calls from the call center like what is this and then we have to explain ourselves why something went wrong so being able to communicate not just within your group in general but across the company is super important especially getting your um, C levels to really understand your initiatives just because they they report on the basic performance of how things are going, but they don't know the back end of what's gone wrong. If you make an email mistake and you're sending uh, maybe originally to a thousand people and that gets out to a million people, you have some work to uh, do to explain why that happened and how you can learn from that. So definitely communication and um, I, I would say even like stand-up meetings, even like 10 minutes out of your day seeing how things are going, uh, that kind of keeps things in line, uh, just to see are there any problems you can foresee. Um, if you're really having like a long-term issue, is it time to kind of figure out do we need another person or do we need to even outsource, trying to get those skills in if you don't have that in-house? That's pretty important. Wow, thank you. Um, one thing you did mention was um, that repetition is, is helpful. Yes. But, you know, so many people, um, are sending out emails maybe once a week or I mean how, so they can't really keep up their skills so how do you address that I think when it comes to skill set and like figuring out what type of project you're working on it's really getting the right uh, people and skills in place and it's really I, I can use an example with um, my home energy report uh, program so in order to really make that work we knew that we needed data scientists uh, they needed someone like me to do emails and before um, that team was informed that team is maybe less than a year old um, in, in general it's figuring like what is actually needed in the back end so um, do you want someone that is going to just take orders and kind of do what people are telling you to do, or do you want to be innovative? And I know uh, with the hiring process to get our team in place, it's getting someone that is very passionate about what they specialize in. So I'm very passionate about email. I think that was very reflective of why I got hired, just because I really cared about delivering really good emails that spoke to the customer, and that was done correctly. Uh, we had a data scientist that was brought on this year, and he's very passionate about figuring out how to segment uh, data uh, correctly, um, what we can kind of use for our benchmarking models, things like that. So if you have that passion, that goes a long way, and um, that way you can be more innovative, you can um, take on new projects and really build from there. And also being curious, like not being afraid to ask questions. Um, when I got hired, uh, my boss actually went on maternity leave for three months, <laughs> and I was kind of by myself. Mm -hmm. But what I did know was who actually um, was controlling data, uh, maybe who was working on IT, and I wasn't afraid to go to those people to ask, like, what do I need to know? Um, what do I need to know about the utility um, service and just in general, how does our technology work? And being able to ask those questions, and I always think no question is stupid, just because you're trying to learn. Um, being able to build that knowledge, and then that's something you can have to work with to be like, why don't we try things a new way? 
And I think that's pretty helpful to uh, succeed in whether, whatever path you want to go on. Great. I think at this point we can open it up to questions. Does anybody have any questions for Christina or Sharma? Steve, do you have a question? <laughs> Okay, Doug. Doug Henderson, Doug Henderson, EAB. Um, I've been a team of uh, a dozen or so, and so as you are building a team in different parts of an organization when you've been around for a long time, I'm interested in, uh, and, and then I took over the deliverability role, and I went from leading a team of over a dozen folks, um, lots of high pressure, to uh, just me and building email deliverability as a core tenant of the, of the organization, which we knew needed to happen. Um, how do you continue to show value in terms of individual career growth? So you guys have done a great job of talking about how, how do you get a lot done uh, with, with few resources. But from an individual who's maybe considering doing something similar, that was a big struggle for me going from you know, the perception of having um, a lot of responsibility and having people working directly for you. How do you show leadership within an organization? How do you show that a team of one or a small team um, can be just as valuable in terms of career progression and being a subject matter expert uh, and managing a process or a function as opposed to managing people? Yeah, I can, I can start with that. Um, I will say that I had really great leadership um, this season that kind of pushed me to continue to make sure that the organization, like those in the C-suite, knew all the work that I was doing. Um, so when we had different campaigns that came up, like for Black Friday, like our VP was very vocal about sending an email to leadership or getting in front of leadership and saying, this is what each individual of my team was doing for this campaign. Um, and that was a huge confidence booster for me because now they knew my name and they put my face with all the email efforts that were going on. Um, so that was was huge as far as like my individual growth and you know, just just kind of going forward um, with different campaigns that we had to do. Yeah, um, I would say really just being open minded to a lot of um, different ideas, and I think it really comes down to personality. Mm -hmm. Personality really has to complement each other with a team. And um, I know that can always be a challenge when you're working with different departments, but at least on a core direct team, you want to make sure that those personalities actually click so that you can have clear communication and then you can support one another. And I would say that support really helps people thrive to take on bigger challenges, to kind of maybe read up more on what they want to learn. Um, I know I've gotten to my role just because I have a very supportive boss who was, um, re I'm very thankful for, for letting me be here today and uh, really to take back what I learned to bring it back to the team so that we can do more innovative type of projects. And having that mindset is just really important to offer to other folks so that they can be like, okay, I can do that too. Let's work as a team and let's like spread that because I think it's also very deep in culture too. If your culture is very closed up and they're always going to do the same thing, you're not going to be able to innovate and make some new things and really not only meet your KPIs, but also learn, learn as a person. So, Excellent. By the way, I have a, uh, I have a question. How many of you consider yourselves a team of one? <laughs> All in one table. Okay, a team of two. Uh, I'm I'm curious about how you guys um, not not just draw from others in the organization, but how uh, how especially in a, in a more isolated role, how you communicate to others in the organization what you do, so they better understand what your role is, so they can give you more back. So they better understand what the challenges are of your role. Uh, I mean, this is something that's come up many years in, in this con conference, is that there's so many pressures on email, so many misunderstandings about how, how email works and doesn't work, what's permissible, what isn't, what, and, um, and, and certain misconceptions about, again, the blast 
um, that everyone, seem, everyone outside of email seems to ask for. So I'm curious about how you go about talking to the rest of your organization so they better understand what you do so they can better help and you can better you know, work within that organization. Uh, I could take that one. Um, I found that during my career in email, it's always been about looking at the failures. And I don't always like to really fail, but I feel like that's kind of the wake-up call for people to be like, wait a minute, we actually need to fix our infrastructure. We need to fix our strategy. And, I mean, when I was brought into Eversource, I think my first two weeks I was just like, oh, my God, we got blacklisted. What do we do now? Um, that, that was just more like, well, what does that mean? And it's like really trying to figure out, okay, like what do – what do people need to know? Okay, here, here's what this means. And uh, from there, it's really trying to figure out, okay, historically, I always pull from historical uh, campaigns, just kind of what, I, I always like to pick people's brains, like, what did you do in the past? Oh, we just sent this out. I'm like, okay, that's somewhere to start. And that way, it's more like, okay, what can we do better? Well, maybe we can start uh, batching things up instead of just sending it out. Uh, maybe we can put some more padding time and that kind of gives like ideas of okay what do you have to work with which is super important on a strategic side of things as well as the technical side of things and it's more like okay um, let's use that as a roadmap and then what can we fill in for the gaps and then with that that you can present that to um, multiple teams and be like here's what we have here's where we want to go what can we do to fill in those gaps? Do we have to outsource? Um, can we pull in some other people from other departments? And then from there, that kind of builds the case. We want to do this to get there. Here's what we need to do. So that's super, super crucial. Yeah, and um, from, from my instance, um, we kind of going through our Marketo instance this year, uh, we worked very closely with our analytics team and sales team um, because we were trying to figure out a way to get away from the batch and blast. Um, and email had historically been under our CRM team, like our analytics team. Um, and then it had also been under sales. So now having it under marketing, like those individuals were used to doing email the way they did it back in 99, uh, <laughs> early 2000s. Um, and so it's been very eye-opening sitting with them and helping them to understand how email should be done now um, and how it can work with, you know, if our sales reps are trying to work someone through a funnel but they're kind of getting stuck there and not <laughs> moving, like how can email or even our other marketing channels come in and kind of nudge them along? So that's been... That's been very eye-opening for the organization just to get more respect for the email channel. Okay, I have one, one wrap question for you, Sharma, since you're going to Home Depot. <laughs> and that's a very different organization, much larger. We've had yeah. Home Depot here for many years, so I know how vast the marketing organization is. What, so what role, after, after this multi-purpose role uh, at, uh, at the Atlanta Hawks, what uh, basketball team? Uh, is <laughs> what what role are you what then special are you taking a specialized role at in the email group at Home Depot? Yeah, I'm going to focus. On, I'm going to be a CRM strategy manager. Um, so I'm going to focus on more than just email, which is where I kind of want it to be, anyways. Um, like my love, my first love is always going to be email, but I like to also work on how it works with like your mobile app. Um, how it works with your paid search, how it works with your social. So that's what I'll be able to do going forward with them. Um, and to your point, like that's a huge team. I think I'm going to be like number 22 on the bigger, broader team. Um, so it's definitely going to be a different pace, but uh, I'm used to it. I came from retail, so it's not, you know, it's going to be okay. <laughs> well, congratulations and good luck. Nina, thank you. Thank you, Christina, thank you very much.